Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome uh, to the SETI Institute. Um, I'm Tom Pearson, the CEO of the Institute, and I'm going to introduce our, our speaker today, who's uh, Dr. Peter Jeniskins. Peter has been with the Institute for many years and been doing a, uh, a, a long um, variety of uh, airborne and ground-based observations of meteors uh, and has published many scientific papers uh, on his work. And today you are going to hear Peter speak about the story of, story of asteroid 2008 TC3. Uh, but before we uh, turn it over to Peter to give your talk, I actually want to make a special presentation that, as far as I know, Peter doesn't know anything about. Um, and so it's here in this uh, frame. And it is a, uh, a framed copy of the uh, Nature cover story on this discovery and this Peter is for you to uh, for you to keep and uh, uh, share with your family friends and uh, Thank you. Uh, to to keep forever and ever uh, it's a real honor to work with you Meteor meteorites uh, uh, are uh, uh, abundant uh, we have lots of them in our lab and we can study them we can learn a lot about the processes that uh, the geological processes that led to uh, the asteroids that uh, created these meteorites. The problem is we have no idea uh, where any of these meteorites came from. We do not know what class of asteroids corresponds to what type of meteorites. And uh, people have been uh, fussing with that problem for, uh, for a very long time. So it, it came to quite a surprise when uh, on October 6th last year, uh, suddenly the news came that uh, a small asteroid had been discovered by Richard Kowalski at Catali Catalina Sky Survey uh, in uh, Mount Lemmon in Arizona. And uh, this asteroid uh, was very small, um, only about um, four meters or so in size. Uh, but um, when uh, the coordinates of the asteroid were presented to the Minor Planet Center, the computer choked. Something was wrong. <laughs> uh, Tim Spar in the morning. Uh, noticed that there was a message, please uh, attend to this, uh, uh, we have a problem. And uh, he discovered that uh, the asteroid was coming right at us. And the software was not set up apparently to deal with that. <laughs> so he, uh, which is a little bit surprising given that uh, this the very purpose of doing these surveys is to find asteroids that are coming right at us. <laughs> so um, he contacted Steve Chesley at JPL, and Steve did some uh, calculations, and he confirmed that, yes, this thing is, as they say it so nicely, the nominal orbit comes within one Earth radius. <laughs> <laughs> That's never a good sign. <laughs> uh, but uh, as a, so apparently not to raise a lot of panic, as if a, a, a minor planet circular would do that with a little note in the, in the bottom of a long list of, of numbers. Uh, they said that the absolute magnitude indicates that the object will not survive passage through the atmosphere. In other words, this thing was just too small to bother. And, uh, and, and as I said, Chief uh, uh, calculated that on uh, October 7, early in the morning, this thing was going to hit in uh, northern Sudan. Now, uh, to give you an idea how uh, small this thing is, this is uh, asteroid Itokawa. Um, let's see if we can find it. This asteroid Itikawa, and I don't know if uh, you guys remember the griping that went on in the asteroid community when the Japanese decided that they wanted to go to Itikawa because Itikawa was such a small asteroid. Who could, who could have any interest in that? <laughs> uh, that, of course, it turned out to be a very interesting asteroid, a uh, rubble pile, lots of uh, pieces that uh, came together and that made make up this uh, little asteroid. But uh, the thing that we are talking about is at the same scale here. <laughs> Now, what for an, ast an, uh, an asteroid astronomer is a very small asteroid. Uh, for a meteor astronomer like myself, it's a really big meteoroid. <laughs> and this is the, the regime where these uh, fields uh, overlap. And uh, for the first time, 
I guess for the first time in a long time, I won't say I've never had an email from Don Yeomans before, but suddenly there was an email from Don Yeomans to me <laughs> saying that uh, something peculiar had been uh, detected, namely a small asteroid that was coming right at us. So here the asteroid community and the meteoroid community was, were interacting uh, for the first time uh, very tangibly. <laughs> So of course, as soon as the announcement was made, uh, everybody jumped on this and uh, started tracking this little asteroid. Now the asteroid was discovered when it was already uh, fairly close to the Earth. And when it uh, disappeared in the Earth's shadow, it was about 14th magnitude, which is pretty bright uh, for, uh, as, as asteroids go, except the problem was it was moving pretty fast on the sky and it was accelerating. <laughs> So the tracking wasn't easy. But a lot of uh, people observed this asteroid. It was very uh, well tracked. There were about 570 or so CCD images taken. And uh, as a result of that, the orbit of this thing was uh, very well determined uh, as far as things uh, hitting the atmosphere. If we measure an orbit from a, 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 a bolide, an asteroid coming into the Earth's atmosphere, uh, from, the, from the few seconds that we can see the asteroid move, uh, the orbit is uh, 10,000 times less accurate. So this is a really very precise orbit for something that comes into the Earth's atmosphere. Which is very nice because then we can use this to uh, calculate the orbit back in time to evolve the orbit and see where it, where it came from, how it evolved in the past. Uh, 570 CCD pictures were taken, only one spectrum. <laughs> now this is something that uh, of course needs to change in the future. Uh, the spectrum uh, covered the range from about 540 nanometers, which is uh, sort of in the, uh, in the uh, orange towards the green, and all the way into the near infrared to about 1,000 nanometers. And uh, this is uh, re reflectance, uh, meaning uh, the ratio of the, of the sunlight that is uh, reflected back. And you can see that uh, most of the object was fairly gray in color. It's sort of all the, all the wavelengths are... Uh, are reflected back in the same way, except yeah, this wavelength was a, there's a very weak band. This is the, uh, a band of pyroxene. This is very important because uh, this is how we study asteroids. We measure their position, we determine their orbit, and uh, we measure their reflection properties. So all the information we have for most asteroids in space comes from this type of, of data. This is how asteroids are classified. They are put in classes. So the first uh, sort of rumor that went around after seeing this spectrum was that this was a class C asteroid. And class C asteroids are tentatively, because we don't have any proven links, tentatively associated with carbonaceous chondrites. So that was sort of in the back of my head when uh, we went searching, that this might be a carbonaceous chondrite. Uh, in addition, uh, because uh, the asteroid was, um, was so relatively bright, um, and because uh, some people have uh, a very uh, much greater ability than I have, for sure, uh, to uh, change software quickly and get guiding systems adjusted <laughs> so they can keep track of this thing. Uh, these are data by Ron Dentowitz and Marek Kozabal. And I must, must point that out because Ron and Marek joined us on our uh, ATV reentry observing campaign just a week before. So they came back from this mission and they immediately heard about this and immediately ran to their observatory, started changing their, adjusting their tracking software, and then got uh, two hours worth of tracking on this asteroid, measuring, uh, taking CCD pictures ever so often. And uh, as you can see, it's the, the asteroid uh, sort of flickered. You could see it uh, uh, change in brightness. And this is uh, the brightness versus time, and you could see it sort of uh, get gradually brighter when it came closer and uh, flickering. Uh, from this, you can uh, derive the rotation period, so it, this thing was rotating, but uh, it was also tumbling, so this thing was, was doing something like this, non-principal axis rotation, as it's called. Uh, and you can uh, get some sense, it's not completely unique, but you can get sen some sense of the, the shape uh, uh, of this object. So this was the uh, trajectory of the asteroid when it uh, came in. This was at 0 UT on October 7, 1 UT, 2 UT, and, uh, and here it was going to hit. So you could see it just, uh, the Earth's gravity was just able to put it in. We almost missed it. Is that a scale This is on scale, yeah. yeah. Um, 
When I heard the news in the afternoon of October 6 uh, from Don, uh, I was wondering, uh, well, uh, what can I do? <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, there is not that much that you can con contribute when the thing is still in space if you're not an astronomer with a nice telescope. Uh, so uh, I thought uh, what I should do is try and establish contacts with uh, people in Sudan and see if uh, they could observe the fireball coming in and get us information on uh, on uh, how bright the fireball is, what sort of how it how it how the the object broke apart when it came in the atmosphere. This was the area where it where it hit. This is Sudan. Now Sudan. Uh, if you only read the, the American newspapers, you will have a very different picture of Sudan as if you go and actually visit. It's 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 a really beautiful country. It's very big. It's uh, it's the biggest country of Africa, uh, uh, area-wise, uh, and uh, uh, it has the the Nile going through it. And in the the asteroid came in, in on the northern part of uh, Sudan in this area. And so this is uh, the area where it's enlarged. You can see the Nile here. Uh, and this was the approach trajectory of the asteroid. Um, when the thing hit, uh, there was uh, a satellite, a European satellite, Meteosat 8, who was doing scans of the area. And uh, uh, the Meteosat, uh, Meteosat 8 was able to detect a glowing cloud of debris in the sky. They actually uh, got some low resolution spectra of that debris and were able to, to show that it was indeed dust. So they saw a dust cloud. Um, there was a big uh, rumble heard in Kenya. So this, uh, the, the, the sonic boom from the impact traveled all the way to, Sen to Kenya, where it still could be picked up by infrasound sensors. And there was a pilot who had been warned by a friend of mine in the Netherlands, uh, Jakob Kuiper, who is a member of the Dutch Meteor Society. He heard about it, and he thought, OK, well, what can I do? And he thought, uh, well, let's warn the pilots of the Dutch uh, Royal Airline and see if they can keep an eye out for it. And then uh, there was Ron de Porter, who was flying from South Africa up here in Chad, up north. And um, he knew about it. Uh, he set himself with his co-pilot to go and see this thing. And they were watching towards the horizon. He was very far away from the impact. But uh, sure enough, there it was three flashes, as if lightning uh, went off close to the horizon. Now, for a very <coughs> long time, that was the only information that we had of this impact. And for a while, uh, th there was really a sense that that was sort of it. This asteroid had come in. There was, uh, I, should, I should mention, there was also uh, uh, US government uh, satellite observations done. Uh, a, a very short message was uh, put out on those observations. And that basically said that uh, the object uh, exploded at 37 kilometers altitude in the atmosphere. And it looked like that was the end point. And so uh, for a long time, it looked like uh, this, was, this was it. The asteroid had come in. It had been tracked. The spectrum had been taken. Very interesting, wonderful little asteroid uh, hit us. Uh, but, uh, but, it's, but now it's gone. It just com it didn't, as, as the MPEG said, it did not survive the passage through the atmosphere. Then um, <coughs> shortly after the uh, event, uh, I came in contact with uh, a person called Maui Ashidat, who is a physics uh, professor at the University of uh, Khartoum. Uh, he uh, is uh, sort of the resident astronomer in Sudan. Uh, his main job, apparently, is to keep track of when the moon uh, becomes just visible <laughs> uh, following the Ramadan. So um, <laughs> it's a different level of, uh, of, of science than, than we, we might be used to. Uh, Mario uh, turned out to also do a lot of other things. He's uh, he, uh, the chair of the, uh, he used to be the chair of the Archaeological Society in uh, Khartoum. He's active in environmental projects, in uh, developmental projects. Uh, so he's a, he's a real organizer. And, uh, and that turned out to be uh, the key to my story here. So I really uh, have to thank him for me being able to stand up here and talk, talk with you about this. Uh, about a month after the impact, uh, Maui has sent me these pictures. <coughs> and they were taken by uh, an eyewitness to the, to the event uh, who had the frame of mind to whip out his cell phone and uh, take some pictures of this really bright cloud that was uh, shining in the sky. This was taken from Wadi Halfa. And uh, you can see it's, uh, it's really, there was uh, six of these where you can see that uh, this, is, this orange glow is because of uh, 
sunrise. It's the orange glow of the rising sun. So these parts are higher up in the atmosphere and they're already bluer. From, from that perspective, the sun is, the sun is blue. <laughs> So these were fantastic images, but uh, they were taken in twilight. You can see there are no stars in the background. And so there's not a lot you can do with it, except uh, make it into a really nice picture and, and <laughs> submit it <laughs> to astronomy picture of the day. <laughs> so that's what I did. And um, it would fe was featured on November 8th. <laughs> then Maui, I used this picture. Uh, plus, uh, I had asked if I could come and visit and, and hopefully uh, get some uh, some. Uh, astrometry dump, some star background pictures taken from the same perspective as people are taking this photograph, um, to uh, go to the university and get funding, and to have the university sponsor uh, a mission. Now, I, everybody seems to be pretty pessimistic about there being chances of something surviving, because this thing, uh, as the Air Force said, had exploded at 37 kilometers high in the atmosphere. But uh, I just come back uh, here with Jim and, uh, and Chris, uh, from a, a rather exciting adventure to uh, Tahiti, uh, the South Pacific, where we flew two research aircraft uh, on the Pacific alongside the approach trajectory of Europe's first uh, air freighter for the supply of the ISS, the ATV. And we had seen ATV uh, explode very high up in the atmosphere and then uh, sort of break apart when it came further down. And uh, from that uh, first explosion, a lot of debris came forth. So I wasn't that convinced that, uh, of course the conditions are very different, but I wasn't convinced that, if, uh, that an explosion necessarily meant that nothing survived. Uh, the interesting thing too was, and that's why I'm showing uh, this uh, picture here where uh, I think Jim is one of the, maybe not. <laughs> um, I just a week before this thing hit, I was sitting in that swimming pool talking with uh, the uh, pilot of the Gulfstream aircraft, talking about that in the future, Astronomers were sure going to find a small asteroid. It was going to hit the Earth. would going to create a big fireball. And then I would want to go in a plane. I would immediately have want to have the plane on standby. <laughs> and I immediately want to go and fly there and see this thing come in and observe the fireball. Because chances are that this, happen, this will happen over the ocean. Two thirds of the Earth is covered by ocean. So, uh, so when I heard about this uh, a week later, that there was an asteroid coming in. <laughs> it was going to crash. <laughs> And uh, I was still sort of reeling from the campaign. Uh, the first thing I did was to call Don to confirm that it was really true, because this was just unbelievable. And uh, then when I learned that it uh, came down over uh, Sudan, I checked to see if I could actually fly there. And it turned out that it was too short notice. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so we had to do other things. But that wasn't uh, so. Um, so now the thing had. Uh, had impacted, uh, th there had been a big explosion apparently, but uh, uh, we didn't know what happened from the debris. Something could have co co come through. Um, and uh, and so, uh, so th the next thing to do is to ask, okay, where are you gonna look? Now initially, uh, there was a lot of confusion. Uh, the, the, the general approach trajectory uh, was known uh, the Air Force uh, had a position given, which was fairly uncertain, with about this, this much uncertainty, about uh, uh, over 10 kilometers. And uh, if, if you have uh, an asteroid come in and it breaks into pieces, uh, then those pieces will uh, be blown away by the winds. And so you have to take into account not just the approach trajectory and, and uh, worrying how much material survives and how fast it comes from that explosion, but you also have to worry about how the winds drift, the uh, drift the meteorites. So these were my first uh, calculations. And I don't know if you can see it, but this is a railroad here. And uh, here is a little station called Station 6. And <coughs> that's where I put my uh, first my 100 gram pieces. <laughs> now, uh, first thing I did was uh, I was trying to constrain the conditions as much as I could. So I called Steve Chesley and I asked him, uh, can you please calculate the approach trajectory? Uh, you, ha you know the orbit. Tell me where exactly uh, is, is the path projected on, on the atmosphere. <laughs> and so uh, Steve uh, calculated this distribution of points here where exactly the path was. This is at 50 kilometer altitude. So he had the trajectory uh, coming in. He didn't include any effects of the atmosphere, just, uh, just uh, the, the path. Now Steve's 
uh, trajectory, this, so this is based on all the 570 or so points that people had measured from the asteroid, was so precise that the uncertainty perpendicular to the trajectory was only about plus or minus 100 meters. So it was really <coughs> uh, very precise. We knew exactly along what line to look. The problem then was where along that line to go and look. Because here the thing was at 40 kilometers, here 30, there 20, there 10. And this whole uh, range was about 60 kilometers. So we had a range of 60 kilometers to look, and then uh, with some uncertainty from what the winds would do to the, to the uh, debris fragments. So it was still a huge uh, area. Also, at that time, um, I told you about this explosion that was seen by the Air Force. It was not clear whether that was the end point of the fireball or not. And uh, there were also the Meteosat observations, and the first reports that came out from Meteosat were very different. Meteosat put the, the fireball here, these spots the visible in this area, the near infrared in this area. And uh, these positions were used by uh, geologists at the University of Khartoum to go out by car and go and try and find these meteorites. So they, they traveled all the way to not station six, but station five up here. And they went to go and, and check out that area. And they came back with uh, reports that uh, they couldn't find anything, uh, that there were already a lot of tracks in the sand, so people had already been there. and. Um, that uh, therefore uh, this meteorite was un un unfindable. And uh, you have to realize Maria, in the meantime, was trying to convince the university that they should give some money for, for bringing students out and, and bring me out to the, to the field. And so he had to sort of fight up against that perception at the time. Uh, it turned out that uh, there is a shortcut by station five if you want to go to Wadi Halfa, and so those were all the tracks that were in the sand. <laughs> So, and it turned out that these positions were off because uh, Meteosat looks at an angle at the asteroid, and when the asteroid is at an altitude, and you see it projected against the surface a little bit further away. Lots of uncertainties. Also, the Air Force position didn't quite go, and this was supposed to be at 37 kilometers, and you can see it sort of sits at five and then a little bit off. So there were lots of, uh, lots of issues. So, um, all, all very good reasons to go and visit Sudan. Uh, now, it turned out, as I said, Mario was a really good organizer. Um, within, within two days, he had organized a visa for me. Uh, he, 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 he talked with the people in Sudan. Uh, everything was basically prepared. I submitted my passport. Two days later, it was back, and I had a visa. Uh, then um, I made the big leap. We decided that uh, December uh, 2 to 9 was going to be the period that I would visit. Uh, the communication with Sudan was very spotty, very brief emails. Uh, very difficult to get a sense on what was going on. So I really went with uh, understanding that I would very likely be stuck in Khartoum for a week. <laughs> would be very lucky if I would have a chance to speak to the dean of the university or somebody who <coughs> might be able to help Mawia bring uh, a, a, a search campaign together. Um, ho hoping that we might be able to speak with one of the eyewitnesses. So it looked all pretty dim. But instead, when I arrived uh, at the university and I met Maria in person, uh, it turned out that um, everything was uh, incredibly well organized, with a lot of people uh, uh, helping to put things together. When I arrived, I was being filmed by a TV crew. I thought it was the university's uh, local station, but it turned out to be Al Jazeera. Apparently, Al Jazeera <laughs> headquarters in Qatar. <laughs> had heard that there was uh, an American coming to the University of Khartoum talking about this asteroid. So they had sent out this TV crew. Um, uh, Maria organized for me to give a talk at the university uh, so I could sort of help encourage uh, the search campaign. And I gave, gave my talk. And uh, shortly after the presentation, we uh, traveled to, to that afternoon, we traveled to the search area. Uh, it's about a 10-hour drive up door to Abu Hamid here along the Nile. And then the, the Nile makes a loop like this. And then uh, it's uh, still uh, a while through the desert to get to the station where we wanted to be, Station 6. And then the next plan was to go to Wadi Halfa, talk with the eyewitnesses that saw the event here. And I took the pictures, go back here, and then uh, check, out the e check out the area. Six hours over narrow roads, a lot of traffic. Four hours through the desert, no road. <laughs> this is the main artery between Sudan and Egypt. It's a one-mile-long stretch of sand that the truck drivers go along to, uh, to deliver their goods. 
every 30 kilometers there is a station. This railroad was built by uh, General Kitchener when he invaded Sudan, end of the 19th century. Um, and he, uh, he built every 30 kilometers uh, one of these rail railway stations. And Station 6 is still occupied. It has water and it acts as a truck stop for the sort of the tea house and people can buy snacks and spend the night there. This was our uh, mode of transport. It was a pickup truck with a vat of diesel in the back, <laughs> or low key. <laughs> we had no problems. We drove all the way up to the, uh, to the area. Uh, we had the Al Jazeera team uh, driving with us, so they took this picture. And, um, the, and this way, um, we were able to uh, sort of keep an eye on each other, because we did get stuck in the sand at one point. We talked with the eyewitnesses on the way over. Uh, it turned out that um, almost everybody along the Nile had seen this. Um, every group of people we asked, there were a few people who had, who had um, watched this. Why? Because this happened right after morning prayer. <coughs> and so a lot of people were out uh, walking to the mosque, coming from the mosque, doing prayers. And uh, this was a very frightening event. Uh, overall, the stories we heard were well, of fear, of real fear. So people would associate the bright light, the shock of, the, of, the, of this event <coughs> with, uh, with uh, things happening in their own lives and, uh, and sort of t t translated. Uh, but uh, this information did help us. We, I, I made a, a map that sort of showed the trajectory, so we, we pulled that out and explained people what we were doing and so on. Uh, this uh, helped us uh, get a sense on, uh, on uh, what happened to this, this fireball? So where did this fireball uh, fragment along the trajectory? Uh, I, I got to see the area where the, the astronomy picture of the day was taken uh, by Mr. Mohammed Al-Hassan in Wadi Hafan. Uh, I did some uh, star background images from uh, this location where this picture was taken. The w you can see there was some nice foreground uh, 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 things that they could use to uh, compare. And uh, this, uh, this is uh, how the, the trajectory then translates into elevation and azimuth. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, uh, what was clear from this was that, uh, that the, the asteroid uh, had exploded, that this was indeed uh, the end point of the trajectory. The asteroid had exploded uh, at around 37 kilometers in the atmosphere. And uh, that there was no ablation coming from that. So there should have, there should have been uh, further trails down here, and there was nothing. And uh, most of the eyewitnesses indeed described that uh, they, s they saw the fireball, uh, there was a bright flash, and then about a second afterwards the thing continued, there was another flash, and then it stopped. There was nothing coming from it. Uh, this, is, um, this was the wind drift, so this is the trajectory. These were the two positions provided by uh, US government satellites. This was the position in Wadi Halfa. And uh, initially the train was basically uh, distributed along here, with this being the, the Explosion point, and then gradually the, the wind drifted. And uh, these calculations were done by Jim Albers here. So it's uh, funny to see how the wind has these uh, traumatic effects and creates these wonderful, interestingly shaped structures. Uh, the local people thought that, uh, that the text actually spelled something in Arabic which had to do with Muhammad. <laughs> and, and, not and I can't remember exactly what it was, but uh, this, this surely made an impression on, on everybody. Uh, after uh, we talked with the eyewitnesses and we, and we had concluded that uh, nothing big came from that explosion, uh, we were back at Station 6. And uh, Mawia had organized for a bus with 45 students and staff for us to meet at the station and uh, join us in the searching. Now, by that time, my uh, worries were at all levels. I mean, I was really f starting to feel sick because uh, n never before had anything been recovered from something exploding 37 kilometers high in the atmosphere. That, that there's just no meteorite falls f under those circumstances known. And so uh, what were our chances that something might be found? Uh, I thought uh, we might have our best chance. Uh, certainly, there was no reason to go and look for big pieces, because we, we should have seen those come out of the explosion. So uh, our best chances would be if we look at the smaller, the smaller fragments. Um, let me go back a second. So uh, looking for the smaller fragments basically meant that, uh, so, so here station six is the trajectory. This, uh, this range of mountains here was just a little bit downside from this 37 kilometer point. 
So uh, I, I thought maybe what we should do is go and look in this area here, as far as close as we can get to the explosion, um, just a little bit downrange, uh, and, uh, and then just hope for the best. Have everybody uh, put in a line and, and stop coming. So this was uh, just to br bring home the fact that if you bring 45 students and staff out to the middle of the Nubian Desert, <laughs> uh, all of these people have never been in the middle of the Nubian Desert. So this was a great experience for them as well as for me. Uh, means also logistic, tents, foods, all those things, uh, including uh, there was a religious holiday. So there had to be services organized. Permission had to be asked from parents so that uh, the women could come along. Lots of different things that uh, that came came into play to to pull this together, and so uh, Maui did a tremendous job. Um, this was uh, our tea house. <laughs> uh, they were serving uh, extremely strong tea, the strongest tea you've ever had. <laughs> uh, but I tell you, if you've been walking in the desert for a day, it tastes very good. <laughs> uh, even 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 made with local water. <laughs> So that meant that uh, we had to go all the way into the desert for about 29 kilometers. Now, there are no roads there. So uh, what we did was we lined up two cars um, with the GPS in the hand, uh, drove the, the cars along the asteroid trajectory and one kilometer north to the asteroid trajectory. Uh, the, the wind uh, calculation suggested that the meteorite sh should be slightly north of the, of the asteroid track, but not, not much north of it. And uh, the idea then was to, uh, to see which road was best and then try and bring the bus with the students down to that area. So we did, and uh, s miraculously the bus managed to get all the way to the end of that road. It took us all day. It was, uh, I think we had uh, two, two hours left at the end of the day to do some searching. Now, the Al Jazeera uh, crew was still uh, following us, still filming what we were doing. Um, but they were only allowed to join us that very day, so they were going to go next day. And so they uh, were filming us walking around, mm -hmm. uh, setting up and so on. It's all, uh, all great to see, about 20, 30 meters apart. Uh, you can see the terrain is very gravelly. Uh, there's, there are stretches of sand in some places, but most of it were hills and, and, and a lot of gravel. So you couldn't really look very far away from where, where you were walking. So effectively, you couldn't put people further away than 20 or 30 meters to have, uh, to have any chance of picking these up. And so we walked for, uh, for two hours. We saw lots of interesting things. I mean, a lot of petrified wood, uh, a lot of, I picked up really big uh, calcite crystals. Um, and of course, put those back down because you're not supposed to take anything from Sudan. <laughs> uh, beautiful, beautiful, uh, interesting, uh, interesting uh, things. Uh, I even found some archaeological sites that uh, people hadn't visited, uh, that people didn't know about. Um, which was very exciting to just be the first sort of and see this this little circle of stones filled with sand, sitting there in the crevice of uh, some hills. Uh, but uh, after two hours of walking, after a whole day trying to get this road created, moving all the people, having uh, gone through the desert back and forth to Wadi Halfa and so on, I, <laughs> I was tired, <laughs> and I was uh, pretty um, pessimistic that uh, we might be successful. I looked at some of the black rocks, so I asked the students to look for, bl for dark stones. Meteorites have a, have a black fusion crust. Uh, very freshly formed meteorites have very characteristic uh, black fusion <coughs> crust. So I showed them some examples. I said, that's what we're looking for. They showed me some things, and non none of it was real. And so after two hours, end of the day, sun is rising. We really almost have to go. Uh, suddenly, a car came to me and uh, with a very excited driver, and he said, oh, a student has found something. And I, I remember thinking, nah, not again. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm s jumping in the car, go to the student, and uh, his name was uh, Mohammed Alamin. And Mohammed uh, has a knack for these things. He really he's, he was really, really good at this. Um, he uh, showed me this little piece. It was only about this big. And um, I looked at it, and uh, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. I mean, here's a fusion crust, very clearly. You can recognize f from anything found on the Earth, a fusion crust is very, very characteristic. So what he had in his hand was a meteorite. We didn't know if it was from the asteroid, but it was a meteorite. Uh, looked very weird. 
strange banded uh, pattern in it and some, some brown spots. So I was worried that might maybe it was something that had been sitting in the desert for a long time. Uh, but uh, but uh, otherwise, it was a black rock. I mean, what are the chances to find something that looks, looks carbonaceous? Um, and, so, uh, and so I said, yes, this is what we are looking for. Well, the soon I, as I said that, you could just see the, the word uh, spread <laughs> from where I was standing. <laughs> People started going, ah, da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> Even the bus came uh, driving up the sand path and uh, people hanging out of the windows <laughs> going, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the guys from Al Jazeera were saying goodbye to everybody. They were on the hill, just down from where I, where I was shown this little meteorite. And they saw the commotion. They came racing down the hill, <laughs> <laughs> filming everything. And so they had their fantastic story to tell. And uh, in hindsight, this was a little piece from our asteroid, which we didn't, didn't know for sure at the time. Uh, that evening, Mawia had gone, uh, while I was working with the student, Mawia had <laughs> gone to uh, uh, with his car to go and a search the area for the somewhat bigger pieces. So he was driving around to see if he could find something. And so uh, so he didn't uh, enjoy all the melee, but we met in the evening and um, I showed him the little meat ride. And what we <coughs> asked the students to do is they, uh, 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 I, I was expecting carbonaceous chondrites, which means organics, uh, which means you don't want to touch it with your fingers. You want to keep it clean from organic contamination. And the simplest way of doing that is by having people use aluminum foil to, to handle the meteorites. And so we had everything wrapped up in aluminum foil. This, by the way, is a little piece. So after the talk, you can come. This is a little piece of asteroid 2008 TC3, the very first sample from a known object <laughs> in space, uh, as, as, as it being, a, being an asteroid, and apart from some crumbs that uh, started brought back very, very well, of course. Um, this, is, uh, this is how we had it wrapped up, and uh, Maria uh, sat down, uh, he unwrapped the aluminum foil, he looked at it, and he said, incredible. Mm -hmm. And you could just see all the, the stress and <laughs> thing fall, fall from him, because I uh, remember what an uh, effort he had made to, to put all this, this together. And so at that point, we knew that meteorites could be found. We weren't certain yet that we had meteorites from our asteroid. Well, the next day, we started at the position where we found the first meteorite. And then we started finding these very black-looking, scruffy meteorites, very thinly crusted. And uh, they were very so weird, so strange, so out of there. Clearly meteorites, clearly something unusual that, um, that we knew we had material from the asteroid. They were, they were f sort of found along the asteroid trajectory. And uh, that was just an incredible uh, experience. And then the uh, <laughs> next day, we started finding bigger and bigger pieces. And then we could take pictures with everybody around them and celebrate. <laughs> uh, that day, the students walked 18 kilometers. So by the end, everybody was very tired. But when a few big ones were found, big being meaning sort of chicken egg size, uh, people were very excited. So between the first one we found, which was about this big, and the last one we found, which was about this big, was 29 kilometers. And of course, this led to our second astronomy picture today. <laughs> <laughs> Fragment number uh, 15 sitting there, uh, as is, this is how it fell, <laughs> right on the desert, it's not uh, put in scene, this is really the way it is. <laughs> if you look carefully, you can see there are some footsteps here from people <laughs> uh, looking at it. Uh, very weird looking, sort of like a little um, loaf of bread, and turns out that these particular meteorites are known to, to look like that. I didn't know that, but it is... Uh, and then uh, we started also seeing that the meteorites were not homogeneous. Uh, this was number 14, looked a little bit crumbly texture. Uh, this was number 16, had a very fine grain texture. So we, we were seeing lots and lots of different textures. They were all very dark, but all different textures. And so this was then the area we had searched. And you can see that uh, up here station 6 again. And this is the, the asteroid trajectory the dash line. <coughs> That's our trajectory. And uh, th the yellow area is what where we walked to search for meteorites. So this was about, the first day was about two kilometers, then about eight kilometers, and then about 15. Uh, this, uh, this meteorite, by the way, this one, uh, was found very close to the bus by a student who was completely fed up with searching. <laughs> <laughs> Had been uh, complaining to me endlessly that he was fed up with searching. <laughs> 
and they walked to the bus, and then they found the speech right. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a hero. He's a hero. Uh, that meteorite, by the way, is now in Italy uh, being measured for co uh, gamma ray cosmic nuclei. <coughs> so then, uh, uh, after th uh, the three day search, uh, my ticket home, I had another meeting going on, so I had to be leaving. So I spent the next day uh, traveling uh, four hours over the sands, ten hours over the, what is it, uh, six hours over the, over the road. Uh, in a wobbly car and so on, completely classic, but I managed to get to the airport and flew back home. And then uh, a few weeks later, uh, Mawia uh, and his crew, this time with 72 people helping him, went back to the area and uh, they start searching from where we left over and looking for the bigger things and they couldn't find anything. Uh, all these uh, strange weird GPS tracks is because they had to circumnavigate a geologic structures to try and find where the areas where they could search. Uh, then some stu uh, some students went back to the area just south of the trajectory and looked for a small part here and found lots and lots of meteorites in this area. Really big big pieces uh, we decided. And so that was very exciting. Uh, this was one of the meteorites found, number 27, which now is everywhere on the internet. Very scruffy looking, not sort of sc with a sc scaly, flaky uh, texture to it. Uh, they also found this one. Uh, which sort of brought home this really wide variety of meteorites that there were in our asteroid. And we were very, uh, we still are puzzled by how you can have that wide of a variety of materials in there. Well, it turns out that this is not part of our meteorite. <laughs> this is an ordinary gondrite. This has been sitting in the desert for a long time. <laughs> so this is the sort of thing I was worried about. So, so we found more than just one meteorite. We found a number. And this is the, the where, uh, what the area we searched and uh, where we were when we published ourselves. So it was clear that there was something weird going on here because there were a lot of meteorites in this area. So you would think there might be a lot of meteorites up here as well. Uh, if, the, if the energy of the pieces coming out is big, then they, uh, they will scatter uh, rather widely. So the, the small pieces are slowed down very quickly by the atmosphere and they fall very close to the impact point and very, uh, they, they also are stopped quickly in that direction. So they fall very close to the trajectory. And then the big pieces are slowed down a little less quickly, so they keep moving and they end up all the way down here. But also they end up being spread out more. That was the theory. And so this suggested that there might be a lot more, me more uh, meteorites to be found uh, uh, in this area. And it was clear that we needed to do some vertical scans to really get a good sense of that. Now again, from here, where we found the first piece, to here is 29 kilometers. And so, the, uh, so it took us a while to understand what was going on. Uh, but uh, what really went on was that there was this 80,000 or so kilogram asteroid coming in. It exploded. Uh, pretty much everything went into dust. Some of it evaporated. And a few pieces survived. We, we picked up about five kilograms. And so those five kilograms of pieces were then scattered out uh, from that area, but still going at the speed of the asteroid because the asteroid was not significantly slowed down at that altitude. So everything came out of that explosion with pretty much 12.4 or so kilometers per second. <laughs> if it comes out that fast, then things get spread out this much. And uh, so you end up with having uh, very small pieces, and you end up with having this stuff uh, tremendously spread out. And so this is very different from normal meteorite falls. Normal meteorite falls, the thing penetrates deep in the atmosphere and then breaks into a number of big chunks. And so you have to go and look for those big chunks um, uh, somewhere along the trajectory, and that is difficult because there are a few of them. In this case, there's lots and lots of little pieces <laughs> that, were s that were scattered around, but they are spread over a huge area. So it turns out that the, t the strategy we were using was, uh, was perfect for this sort of thing. And this is, uh, shows, of, uh, shows again the calculations uh, with uh, the spread of the pieces. This was 100 meters per second dispersion if you get an explosion here. You can see that things uh, it's very close to the approach trajectory, a little bit north of it here, and then um, and then about this widely scattered. But if the if the ejection speed is 200, this is sort of the normal circumstance. If the if the uh, ejection speed is just a factor of two higher, then uh, you end up with uh, bigger dispersions, and uh, you can see that uh, again it's fairly narrow with the small pieces. It gets wider with the big pieces, but uh, this can get very wide, and so uh, we really wanted to. 
understand what the circumstances were in the explosion. So we went back at the end of February. And that was my second visit to Sudan and the third trip we did to look for the pieces. Now, never uh, challenge a good thing. Okay, first trip, everything went just perfect. Everything was well organized. Uh, first day, we found one piece, so we knew we had a meteorite. Second day, we found a few pieces, so we knew we had pieces of the asteroid. And the third day, we found some bigger chunks, so we, we indeed had confirmation that some bigger pieces could be found as well. So for me and for the students and for Maria, this was, f was great. Every day was, a, was excitement. We came together in the evening. We sat in a circle, and Maria did his uh, re-evaluation of the day, and it was just, it was just excitement. The third time, the third search was a nightmare. <laughs> I arrived in Khartoum uh, on a holiday, so I had to wait for the for the holiday period to end. Then it turned out that the bus, uh, that this was the vacation uh, period, so the, all the buses were being used for the ge various uh, geological various uh, expeditions they're doing. Uh, so we didn't have a bus for the students, so we had to wait until the bus became available. So I sat several days in Khartoum uh, waiting to for this to be resolved. Then uh, a British TV crew uh, wanted to come along and they documented everything we were doing. Well, Mawia thought it might be a good idea to, instead of having a pickup truck with a vat of diesel in the back, <laughs> if you're going to be filmed, to have a nice, sort of a beautiful white Jeep rented. Uh, the, the same Jeep as the UN are using in, in Sudan. Uh, and uh, of course, sure enough, if you go and drive it with three of these beautiful white looking jeeps through Sudan, uh, you will get all sorts of attention. <laughs> and so with every single checkpoint, we were stopped and we were asked what we were doing, where we were going and what the things were. And then when we finally arrived in the area in northern Sudan where this thing fell, um, we were all ready to go and, oh, finally, we're there, let's go search. Uh, a sandstorm came in, <laughs> very first day. And it completely wiped out today. It was at 9 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> we just really ready to, to, to load the buses. The wind was picking up, and suddenly the sand started blowing. And I'll tell you, it, you, cannot, you cannot operate in those conditions. It's just uh, you're really sandblasted. It's literally. And so at the very end of the day, the, sand had the, the conditions had uh, tempered a little bit. Uh, we did try to go out, but we didn't find anything, sort of as an exercise for the student. Uh, but at that time, it looked like sandstorms typically last a few days. And so it uh, looked like <laughs> all our period would have been spoiled. But fortunately, uh, next day cleared up. It was still very windy, so we all uh, for shawls and hats and keep ourselves clear. Uh, this is what 52 students and staff look like when they are searching the Nubian Desert. Um, this we now spread out over two kilometers. Uh, to survey the, the area. This was uh, in the sand plains close to the station where, uh, where the bigger pieces would have been fallen. And uh, it turned out that um, there were no pieces, very few pieces north of the trajectory. <laughs> and the southern part was already pretty well covered, so we didn't find a lot that, that day. Uh, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> I found my first one, <laughs> and it was very exciting. Of course, this picture was, was made afterwards, uh, <laughs> put in scene. But uh, I, I tell you, 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 you arrive, you, uh, uh, what usually happened was I, um, uh, I would uh, go b with the cars from student to student to, to look at what they had found and to, to log and map the, the find. Uh, but when uh, nobody was finding some, uh, something, uh, I would ask the driver to drop me off in where there was a hole. So the students sort of would uh, not, it's difficult to keep walking straight, so it wouldn't be these holes created. So I would asked the driver to drop me off there so it could be helpful. And so, so he did. Uh, he dropped me off in, uh, in a hole like that. And I started walking. And I see a line of footsteps. And I'm thinking, oh, that's not a good spot because somebody has already been here. And then two meters away from that line of footsteps, I see two rocks sitting in the sand. And I'm thinking, um, that can't be, can it? And so I'm walking to it. And I'm really looking at it <laughs> close up. And I say, holy, that's a meteorite. <laughs> And then, you, and then you sort of are the first to see these things sitting there on the sand, just the way they fell and fell. And it's an incredible feeling. And at that moment, nobody knows about it. The, 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 the people on the front are walking there. And it's very quiet. And, uh, and you're just looking at that in amazement. And then, of course, the first thing I do is take the walkie-talkie and say, Mawia, look at this. <laughs> and then he, of course, came racing in and uh, got the pictures taken. 
so after we uh, we took lots and lots of pictures about this meat right there, you can see when it hit the ground, it broke in pe this uh, little piece came off here. Um, I went back into the car. The group now had advanced quite a bit, and so I asked the driver to uh, catch up, and so uh, so he was racing to to catch up with the group, and then suddenly he was driving straight over another black rock sitting there in the sand, and he put his wheels right in between the, the rocks, which was right on the axle, and I see it, and I feel that adrenaline <laughs> rush, and I say, stop! <laughs> and we turn around, and sure enough, another one. And those are the two biggest meteorites found that day. <laughs> <laughs> So this one I'm sharing with the uh, driver because uh, he picked that rock. <laughs> so <laughs> and so while I was all excited that I had found three meteorites in just, uh, in just half an hour, uh, one of the students that was driving with us uh, suddenly started uh, going, ah! <laughs> and turned out that this rock, too, had lost a little piece. And that little piece had ended up a little bit further, and she had found that. <laughs> and so we had a... <laughs> and then, of course, uh, after we'd done the, the vertical scan in the big field, we went to the uh, to sort of an, uh, a smaller area and did a vertical scan there. And it turned out that meteorites were everywhere, everywhere, uh, to the point that uh, the bus got stuck in the sand. A student steps out. Uh, he sees a meteorite. <laughs> 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 and, and the protocol is that he waits with the meteorite until I come, or Mari comes and locked, uh, locks the meteorite. And so he sits there waiting. You can see that's the meteorite. <laughs> A little circle in the sand around it. And uh, while the rest of the crew is pushing the bus out of the sand, <laughs> he's patiently waiting and, uh, of course, uh, very quickly uh, recorded the meteorite so that he could help too with getting <laughs> this thing out. And uh, this is the distribution as we have it at the moment. So we need to have a larger distribution of big pieces, but most of them are just south of the trajectory. <coughs> and uh, the small pieces, so we did a vertical strip here. The small pieces are really tightly concentrated in this area. And so the first uh, search we did was up here. It was really at the edge of the strewn field, as you can see. And then we did a, we did a search uh, further down. We found lots and lots of pieces uh, coming down. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure there is a lot more to be found. At least this, uh, the, 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 the notion, this gives us a sense on how much material came down, because we think we are pretty much covered here, and we are pretty much covered here. And that should tell us then how much mass ultimately came down on the ground. And then it was time for some sightseeing. <laughs> so uh, this time around, I got to drive with the students uh, past, go, go up to Wadi Hafa again, and then along the Nile, all the way down to, uh, uh, to Khartoum, and we visited the, the various archaeological sites in, Sud in Sudan. And uh, uh, those are incredible. Because um, unlike Egypt, where everything, uh, where tourism has been organized, um, in Sudan, uh, the areas are, uh, uh, are fenced, if you like, uh, with a gatekeeper person who keeps an eye on things. And you have to uh, get permission. You have to buy a ticket, basically, in Khartoum to uh, be able to go to these sites. So there's very few visitors. When you arrive there, you're just you and the, and the ruins. And it's, uh, it's incredible, <coughs> incredible to see those. Uh, very, very uh, nice. Um, when we were in, um, on the way back, when we were in um, about halfway down the Nile, um, this is when uh, Omar al-Bashir was indicted. And so uh, uh, people started throwing rocks in, uh, through embassies in Khartoum. And so we uh, took it easy, <laughs> moosing down, and uh, ended up going back about a day or two later. And by that time, of course, everything had calmed down, and uh, there were no issues. So as soon we had uh, the permissions organized to indeed be able to uh, analyze some of this material, I made sure that um, uh, some material went to uh, a number of people. The first person I contacted was Mike Zelensky, as he's an expert on carbonaceous chondrites. And at that time, I still thought I, I had some, some sort of carbonaceous chondrite in hand. Well, um, this was the first uh, meteorite we analyzed, number seven, the person who found it. And this is how it looked like. So it's a small meteorite, was only this big, centimeter or so cube. Um, I brought it to Ames, where we uh, put a we press on it, and we pressed it down very gently, uh, measured the, the compression strength, and then uh, had a piece of it break off. And this is, so we created a fresh surface area. 
And you can see that uh, it broke along uh, a layer rich in some white material. Uh, uh, this was a pi one of those layers, a pyroxene rich layer. And then uh, these are the measurements I made here at SETI to get the reflection spectra measured. And we redid that then at Ames, and we did it. Uh, Janet Bishop here uh, has a field spectrometer we used. We used different techniques to try and get uh, as good spectroscopic information as we could on this on this niche wide. Uh, this is uh, Alan Fitzsimmons uh, spectra from uh, uh, from um, the asteroid itself, <coughs> and then these these are my measurements and uh, Janice's measurements of the uh, niche wide. Uh, fresh appropriate surface. And you can see that the meteorite basically reflects sunlight the same way as the asteroid does. So which suggests that the asteroid did not have uh, d uh, debris or rubble on the surface. It was really sort of a clean cut rock. <coughs> and it's actually a very strange spectrum. There's not that many asteroids that, uh, that have a flat uh, spectrum in the visual and then a weak pyroxene band. Uh, but uh, comparing it to the various uh, spectra, these are sort of averages that were uh, compiled by Takiro Hiroi. And you can see that uh, the, the for the C type that, we, that uh, uh, were originally thought, the C types bend down uh, going towards the blue, which uh, our meteorite didn't have. Uh, the, the F types uh, and the B types seem to be the the most similar to what we are having, with uh, the, uh, both having a weak pyroxene band. Uh, the difference between F and B is a little bit debated, because different astronomers use different definitions of taxonomy. <laughs> and so it's, uh, some, some just make the distinction in, in uh, albedo, uh, dark being F, bright being B. In that case, uh, ours could probably also have been a B. Uh, but others make a distinction between wet and dry, so the, the B ones being wet and the F ones being dry. Well, our meteorite was definitely dry. Uh, there was no tri 3 micron band. Uh, it's measured by uh, Scott Sanford in his lab at Ames. So uh, we, uh, we, we settled on this meteorite, this asteroid being most likely an F-class asteroid, which is a rare type. There are not that many of them. Uh, this is, uh, again, uh, Ron Dentwitz's uh, light curve data. Well, you can translate that and uh, correct it for distance and so on and absolutely calibrate it. And that then uh, shows you how the asteroid looks if you put it at, at a fixed distance. And uh, from the, the center of this curve, you get a very precise measurement of the brightness. And coupled to the albedo, uh, uh, we would, uh, which, which we thought was about 0.46, that would then give a diameter of 4 meters. We've since redone the, uh, the reflection measurements. Uh, and uh, it looks like that this type of reflection measurement is more typical for most meteorites. Uh, and so the albedo is going to be somewhere around uh, 0 0.9, 0 0.10 or so. And so I, I think that uh, this size uh, will come down a little bit uh, when we're all said and done. But we're still talking about something <laughs> <laughs> the size of your, uh, your car. So it's a fairly small. Uh, small object. Then Mike uh, looked at this meteorite, and the first thing he uh, told me when I uh, spoke with him was that he had never seen anything like it. Now, that's a good thing. <laughs> you want to hear that from a scientist, <laughs> especially if he's an expert in the field, because that meant that we had something special. <laughs> and it turned out that this meteorite was uh, special because uh, it has uh, had chunks of uh, carbon-rich inclusions in it. Uh, it had uh, parts of it which were very porous, a uh, lot of empty space, and um, the, uh, for the so for the uh, for the type of meteorite which it was, and uh, we determined it was a uralite, not a combination chondrite, but a uralite. Uh, this was uh, anomalous. Was was uh, was strange. How much carbon in the carbon rich? Uh, I I don't th I don't think we have a number for that. This uh, shows you one of those pores, and you can see that the inside of the pores was covered by these crystals, on the wind crystal. So it was clear from, uh, from Mike that immediately that it was not a carbonaceous gondrite. And so then um, uh, he uh, suggested we send a piece. Uh, he he su suspected it was a urolite, uh, as did uh, Scott Sanford when we looked at the material in the microscope. And then uh, we uh, decided to uh, contact uh, Doug Rumbo at Carnegie Institution because uh, he can do oxygen isotope measurements. And oxygen isotopes are used to classify meteorites. 
uh, in a in sort of absolute scale. So if you look at uh, the amount of, of 18, uh, the isotope 18 oxygen versus 16, and the, the isotope 17 oxygen versus 16, uh, you can make a diagram like this. And uh, you basically get um, a slope here that is typical for Earth-like materials. A slope here that's typical for carbonaceous chondrites. And uh, the different meteorites then fall in the different uh, regimes. So you can see that each has uh, their own area. And ours, ours fell in this area up here. So this was the measurements that uh, Doug uh, uh, Rummel uh, obtained. And so you can see that even compared with normal urolites, uh, this one sat a little bit outside of the, outside of the re uh, regime. Uh, since we've done some more measurements and some more meteorites, and we're now finding uh, some uh, points that are more typical for urolites. So it's quite a range. And then uh, John Friedman at uh, Fordham University uh, Museum of Natural History did a bulk element analysis. And he found this sort of, uh, this is uh, now the, the amount of uh, these elements in the meteorite relative to um, this case of Guy, C1 chondrite. And uh, you can see that all the elements are depleted, but uh, less so if you go to these, towards these elements. This pattern is typical for urolites. And it uh, means that this meteorite was heated to the point where some minerals uh, got molten and the melt drained away. But other minerals stayed solid. So the urolites are a, a really brief window in the evolution of the solar system. So when the, when the asteroids formed by collisions and the, the asteroids became bigger and bigger, uh, some asteroids had collisions that were so violent that they, uh, they got molten throughout. And they got differentiated. So you went from a sort of a, a rubble pile of primitive material, as this carbonaceous chondrites are, to something uh, differentiated like our Earth, where you have an iron core and a basaltic <coughs> crust. Uh, Uralites are right in the in the middle, <laughs> right in this phase. So they represent a very brief period in time when when uh, this process happened. And uh, the, uh, the the si the number of uh, scenarios that are out there for Uralites is how they were created and so on, are uh, numerous. I think it's the most, uh, the least well understood meteorite out there. And so we're hoping that with our urolite, it being so strange as it is, uh, that that will uh, help differentiate between the various uh, uh, urolite scenarios. Uh, basically, there are people that say that this melting happened really deep in the asteroid. Uh, some people think it happened closer to the surface. And uh, so are we hoping that our uh, uh, meteorite will help make, make a distinction between those, those scenarios. And so uh, since that time, uh, asteroids have uh, evolved. They don't grow anymore. Now they break apart because they collide and they break into pieces. They create, create what are called uh, asteroid families, which are really debris fields. So this now is the orbital period of the asteroids. This is the, the elongation, the centricity of the asteroids. Uh, uh, this is uh, the main belt of asteroids. Uh, so they are sort of in that range of period. The Earth is here, Mars is here, somewhere Jupiter is here. Um, you can see that uh, each uh, asteroid here is colored with a different uh, taxonomic type. So the greens are the S types and the, the uh, pink ones are the C types. The, the white ones here are the V types from Vesta. So each uh, different uh, way uh, the asteroid reflects light is, is, is given a different color. You can see that those areas, for example, here with the Vesta group, where um, the, the pieces, the debris, sort of sit in a, in, a, in a region. So the idea is that this originated from a collision of two asteroids uh, that broke an asteroid into, into smithereens. And, uh, and, 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 and that's why we find these. Now, uh, the typical way how we get an asteroid from the main belt to the Earth is by having one of these fragments um, get into an orbital period start going around the sun with a period that resonates with that of Jupiter. And you come into these resonance uh, zones. Once you're in these resonance zones, then, you're, uh, then Jupiter starts to really be in a sudden position in the sky every time when you go around. And the effect of Jupiter becomes very strong. And so what Jupiter then does is it starts uh, uh, pulling or pushing on the, this side of the asteroid and can bring the, can bring the closest point to the sun in. So instead of having a more or less circular orbit, you're going to have an, an eccentric orbit, an elliptical orbit, with the closest point coming towards the Earth. And when it hits the Earth's orbit, then the Earth 
interactions with the Earth can take uh, can change the orbital period of the asteroid and can bring it into a stable orbit, can make it more circular again. And so what typically happens is you pump up the eccentricity very rapidly until you hit the Earth. This is the Earth's orbit, and then uh, and then you gradually make your orbit circular again. And that seems to have happened with our asteroid. If this is where our asteroid is found. If you uh, look at the orbital evolution in the past, there are some solutions that move it up here. And we uh, we have two other asteroids. Asteroid find one has a higher inclination, uh, but one has a lower inclination, and this is also an F-type. So we have two two of F-types. Um, this asteroid and this one could be uh, part of a trail of crumbs, if you like. So that that traces this evolution. So there is a debris field here somewhere, probably in this area, where uh, the, the the pieces are then ejected out and then uh, evolve on. That's really neat because that tells us that this little asteroid here. Not only came from 2008 TC3, but we can also uh, say that it characterizes that specific debris field. Now we still need to. Uh, this is ongoing work, so we still need one to confirm that. We need to find more asteroids with F-type. We have to really find this this trail of crumbs. But uh, this is a this is a possibility. You can actually, with this type of observations, you can bring uh, the asteroid. Uh, you can you can trace the asteroid back to its uh, region in the solar system where it came from. So not only uh, by making this, linking this to F-class asteroids, can you turn this uh, map of colors of asteroids into a geologic map, but you can actually uh, sample specific materials coming from uh, specific regimes, uh, coming from here versus here, and so on. And so that's uh, that's really exciting. Uh, the uh, the shape model that came from the the shape model that came from uh, looking at the flickering of the light and so on gives us the shape of the asteroid. Uh, with this type of observations, we can go so far as to actually calculate under what orientation this asteroid entered the atmosphere <laughs> and uh, see if the if tumbling of the asteroid had any effect in the, in the breakup, things like that. So there's a lot of potential here, a lot of interesting things that are very unique to these observations where you have the asteroid in space and you then see the pieces fall on the ground. So. Moral of the story, as far as asteroids are concerned, smaller is better. Uh, not easy. Turns out that uh, finding these asteroids coming at us is very difficult. Uh, asteroids of this size hit us maybe once a month or once a year, depending on the size. And uh, the, the asteroid surveys are only pointing in small areas in the sky at any given moment. And so uh, chances of picking one up is very uh, li uh, low at the moment. Even when Pan PanStars comes in, there's a big new project. Chances that we find these more is, are very slim. So, uh, but if they can be found, then we may be able to sample other uh, asteroids. And so that will be very exciting. Uh, as far as meteorite falls are concerned, we now know that if there is a big explosion high up in the sky, uh, don't uh, give up. A uh, big explosion just means that you have to go and look for small pieces, which are spread over a very big area. It's very different. You need a different search strategy. You need to look at, uh, look at different places. But uh, you can recover material from this. That means that potentially we, have, we could recover more of these frail, these fragile type of materials. This asteroid exploded 37 kilometers, which makes it, in uh, terms of bolide terminology, uh, a comet. <laughs> this thing hits so, so high up that it, that it would normally have been called a comet, just from the, from the behavior in the atmosphere. As far as meteorites are concerned, we really think this meteorite is going to help us figure out what Uralite is all about. As far as Sudan is concerned, we couldn't have been more lucky. <laughs> Nubian Desert is just perfect place for this thing to fall, and it could have been so much worse. Mm -hmm. Two thirds of the chance uh, was uh, that it would have been in the, in the ocean somewhere. And, uh, and as for the, my collaborators from the University of Khartoum, we c I couldn't have been more, more happy and fortunate. Because to have a group of people that can really organize the search and, uh, and then uh, see it through with such dedication, that's, f that's phenomenal. So uh, join us uh, in Khartoum in December. If you're interested in seeing the country, we're uh, planning to organize a workshop there to discuss the results that we learned from this meteorite. And, um, and you're all invited. And we are, we are hoping to go back to the area and maybe do some more searching. Thank you.
Thank you. So we have time for a few questions. So who owns the meteorite or the, uh, the fragments? Uh, the meteorites are owned by the University of Khartoum. Uh, SETI uh, Institute has an uh, official arrangement, that's what Tom Pearson was talking about, that uh, we have material made available to us for research. Thank you. Hi, Peter. <coughs> Did any of the eyewitnesses report hearing a sound at the same time as the bolide? Because that's a very standard, yes. strange um, perception that you find. Yes. Um, What you're referring to is not the sonic booms, uh, which made it all the way down to Kenya. And uh, the station attendant in station six heard a doo 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 sort of sound uh, uh, a little while after the fireball. But you're referring to electrophonic noises where people hear something while they're seeing the fireball. I don't recall having heard that by anybody. Uh, yeah. I have a question too. Uh, during uh, your talk, you briefly mentioned that it could be a B-type, and then you change your mind because of the inflection. Um, uh, we calculated the, the bell density of a B-type asteroid like this morning, basically. So it we'll, would be interesting to know the bell density of this mm -hmm. meteorite. Do you have this value? Uh, and our, uh, we can measure the density of the meteorites, and uh, they uh, scatter around 2.8 gram per cubic centimeter. A bit, a little bit less than your, than normal your lights, which are around 3.1. Yeah, uh, but there's a wide range, depending on texture. Okay. You please explain once again uh, why the larger pieces downstream did not scatter laterally as much as your theory would yeah. have suggested. It's a, it's an effect of um, uh, the atmosphere slowing down a moving object. So if you, have a, if you have a small piece, then have you have a large surface uh, area compared to its mass. The ratio of surface area to mass is, is large. And so the effect of the, of the drag is strong. The thing is slow down quickly. And so that's a small piece gets sl slow down quickly. The dust pretty much hangs around uh, where, the, where it originated. It's immediately stopped, almost immediately stopped. Uh, small pieces continue a little while and slow down and fall down here. If you have a big piece and you have a small uh, surface area to mass, and so then the effect of the drag is less, and so the piece keeps going. And so the big pieces end up further downstream. But the same thing happens in the other direction too. So if you, if you eject pieces with a certain ejection speed from that explosion, then uh, the small pieces again are quickly slow down, and so they all end up in a fairly sm uh, small area close to the explosion point. And then the big pieces uh, take a little while to, s to slow down from that. So that's why they end up being being further dispersed downrange as well. But I thought you said that they were not dispersed laterally as much as you thought they were. They are dispersed like this. And that's what we expected. Okay. What we didn't expect was that they were 1.6 kilometers south of the track. Oh. And we still can't figure out why that is. We have, uh, of course, limited information on the winds. And so uh, we're suspecting winds. But um, yeah. It's it, uh, with the wind data that we have, it doesn't strive. The, the, the material should have been sli a, a little bit north of the trajectory. Any more questions? No. Especially with that wonderful cell phone image, can we interpret the movement of that cloud in terms of either wind or motion of the camera? No, it's the wind. It's, it's so wind. it was a steady. Yeah, a steady, uh, steady picture. The, the, the pattern is there. Over a period of three or four minutes, uh, just around when the sun was shining on it, it was very bright. That's when all the pictures were taken. And the fact that the surviving fragments were invisible means that they had slowed enough. Yeah, exactly. Everything gets uh, slowed down very quickly. And the, the biggest piece we found would have been slowed down to below the point where it shines at the about 32 kilometers. And so it really gets uh, slowed down very quickly and then, uh, and then falls in dark light. Now, the problem, of course, is that the wind pattern you cannot use to figure out what the winds were in the part where the, the stones were, were, were moving because they're below the train. Okay, so well, thank you very much. Come and have a look and uh, <laughs> for your uh, intimate moment with uh, Asteroid 2018.